Well, good morning. Um, sorry, I was a little bit late to getting started. I should have left this computer on and I forgot. So it's a, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. I appreciate uh, uh, Ludovic and Kwong's um, invitation uh, to attend this panel. I'm also particularly glad that uh, Professor Sharkey uh, follows me because he can correct all of my mistakes uh, after uh, I, I get finished with this. So what I would like to do is uh, um, to first give you kind of an overview of what's happening um, in this field of, of military robots. Um, for those of you who don't have a lot of background in this field, I have a few pictures of assorted robots which I'll run through kind of quickly. Um, and then uh, we can speculate together about some of the ethical dilemmas uh, that are involved uh, in this whole process. So um, let me begin uh, by showing you what a military robot looks like. Uh, everybody recognizes, well, well, it's possible that this is Arnold Schwarzenegger but um, in a robot suit, but, but in any case. Uh, but then you know for sure that these are really military robots because it comes from Star Wars, right? And we all recognize that that's what they are. So, um, uh, kind of the, uh, much of the discussion began in the United States um, with the introduction of the Predator. Um, uh, made by a company called General Atomics in San Diego. Um, and these were really the, the major uh, drone um, aircraft uh, flying both um, in, uh, over Iraq and in Afghanistan as well as in various theaters of war in Africa. And um, so much of the controversy began uh, with these. Uh, the, the Predator has largely been uh, superseded um, by the Reaper uh, which is uh, faster, has a higher ceiling, and carry a heavier payload. You can see it here with uh, two missiles on board, but it can actually probably carry eight. Uh, so it's a, uh, this is a very um, controversial uh, vehicle. And you can see that it's, it's an unmanned vehicle. There are no windows uh, for, for any pilots. So uh, this, uh, this vehicle, uh, has a camera in front, and this is an outstanding military camera. So as you know, it can, it can find a mouse at a mile altitude. And so um, uh, this information is relayed to elsewhere in the world so that these guys are controlled, uh, usually from uh, Nevada or Arizona, um, halfway around the world. And uh, I'd like to show you a video of, of some of this because it raises some of the ethical questions that, that come up later. Um, the Pegasus uh, has an even longer range. It can go a thousand miles. Um, it can travel for, for two hours and is capable of carrier landing. So you can see that, that the aerial um, autonomous vehicles uh, have increased in capability dramatically in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. Um, the Global Hawk, uh, made by Northrop Grumman, um, has a even higher ceiling, 65,000 feet, and it can travel for 42 hours. So that's a, you know, quite an extensive period of time. It's almost uh, two full days and nights. Uh, take a look at the shape of this vehicle, uh, the, the rounded uh, ceiling over where the pilot would sit if there were a pilot, and, and the dual tail. Um, and then compare this with uh, this vehicle, which is a Chinese drone. Um, this is a very similar in shape, has the same um, split tail um, that the other one has, but this one is, doesn't seem to be a jet um, vehicle. It seems to have a propeller in the back. But in any case, um, these vehicles are now worldwide, and military programs like this exist in many countries. And so uh, you, you can find a great deal of stuff on the web about uh, uh, programs going on in China and other countries as well. The uh, earthbound, uh, autonomous earth uh, or ground vehicles uh, really began their success with the Packbot. Um, called a Packbot because it's capable of being carried by a soldier, as you can see here. Um, it travels on two tracks like a small tractor, um, has uh, this long uh, arms that extend a camera, and its objective is to locate um, improvised explosive devices, IEDs, um, located on the sides of vehicles or inside of bushes or elsewhere so that uh, um, uh, they don't cause as much damage to soldiers uh, walking by. And uh, um, I've heard that the, the soldiers themselves become so attached to these vehicles because they've saved their lives a number of times. There's a, there's a story that's circulating around about a, a guy who's uh, um, 
whose pack pot uh, was in fact damaged seriously by an explosive device. And he took it to be repaired uh, to the shop, and he was told, well, it's in, it's in bad shape. Uh, I'm afraid we'll just have to get you a new one. And he said, oh, I don't want a new one. Uh, this is Elsie. Elsie saved my life. I want him back. Uh, so apparently this happens. We have a tendency to get attached to our robots, and as the soldiers do with their pack bots. Um, uh, the dangerous uh, uh, ground vehicles um, look something like, like the swords of the vehicle. They have, uh, um, they're capable of running on tracks. Some of them are amphibious. They can go in and out of water. Um, they, they carry weapons of uh, one kind or another. Uh, so um, this is definitely an, would be an unpleasant vehicle to run across as you're traveling the highways. But it's not all that brand new. Um, actually, uh, during the, near the end of the Second World War, both the Germans and the Soviets had um, uh, semi-autonomous uh, vehicles that looked like little tanks. This one was interesting because uh, it was wire controlled. Um, a soldier could be as far as a mile behind it uh, with a uh, uh, three conductor cable. Uh, two of uh, Two of the conductors were used to steer the vehicle so they could actuate the left and right tracks independently and they could steer it. And the third one was used to detonate an explosive being carried on the vehicle itself. So these were clearly uh, disposable um, and they were not used extensively, but they were used during the <coughs> Warsaw Uprising in the late 19, in the 19, maybe 1944, I've forgotten when, and a few other theaters as well. Um, uh, the Russians had developed a similar uh, vehicle, which is called the Teletank. Again, look at the dates on this, from 1937 to 43, uh, and it was used in the defense of Stalingrad um, during the during that that horrible period um, in the in the depth of the snow. This vehicle was capable of traveling on snow, and it, it carried explosives and was able to to destroy um, German bunkers. Uh, I understand some, some of the bunkers are actually three or four levels deep in the ground, and the explosives on these things are able to destroy those things completely. So um, uh, the, the Crusher is a six-wheeled vehicle, uh, again, carries a machine gun. <clears throat> so you can see that these autonomous vehicles on the ground and in the air are certainly uh, carry lethal weapons, and they're capable of causing a great deal of damage. Of course, uh, the Navy doesn't want to be left behind, and so there are lots of underwater vehicles as well. Um, the, the one at the very top on the left is a, uh, uh, is a robot which is launched through a torpedo tube. Um, it does what it's supposed to do and then comes back and returns back home through the same uh, tube that it left from. Uh, but if you look at the, at the bottom of the ocean there, there are all kinds of mines and other explosives. It's pretty dangerous down there, so I, I think uh, uh, it would be a it wouldn't be a pleasant place to be for divers and, and, and so on. Um, here's one for Boeing, which is just in the process of being launched. Um, just to show you this happening in other countries as well, this is a Swedish uh, um, unmanned underwater vehicle uh, and so on. So I hope this gives you at least a feeling for uh, what's happening uh, in this general area. And I, I, just, I, I hope that this review uh, was at least of some value. So, so what are the ethical issues? Well, you know, beginning with pr since primitive times, our ability to fight war has been concerned with being able to inflict damage at greater and greater distances. In the early days, um, when people fought hand-to-hand -hand combat primarily, you were not very far away from your enemy. Um, we moved further away, we used bows and arrows, um, and clearly this gave us some ability to inflict damage at a greater distance. And the further away the victim was, in some sense, the less it affects our personal feeling of doing harm. Uh, if I attack you with a sword, then I'm very much involved in drawing blood myself. But if I do it by throwing something at you and you're quite far away, it doesn't seem to affect our, our, our own ethical sense uh, quite as badly. So, um, and, and of course, this is particularly true now with the use of drones um, and our ability to control them uh, from, from remote distances. Um, let me see if I can, if I can show you uh, what's going on here, but maybe I can't. Um, uh, let me see what I can do here. Okay, so somewhere in here.
Sorry for this. I thought I knew exactly where it was. In our CV report, yes, yes, see, what features? Overview of military robots. Overview. Predator. Video. Here we go. So, um, well, that's interesting. Where's my picture? It's here. Who's an expert at this? I'd like to project that picture. OK, I have it. Now it's on the screen now. There it is. OK, thank you. That's fine. That's it. OK. All right, so this is a this is at Creech Air Force Base, and it's a control of a predator. Um, so these are two operators that are controlling a predator. Copy, sensor confirms. If possible, keep eyes on building and pick up. Building has the priority. Pilot. MC, in order to do that, I need uh, tail 107 to come off its current target. Get permission for 107 to come south. Copy. And sensor, leave the uh, bridge locked up till we get permission to come off that target. Roger, we'll come. Pilot MC, Shane two two, cleared off target. Sensor, you can break lock on the bridge and lock up the target five with tail one hundred seven. Roger. And we got sixty degrees more of heading. Copy. Pilot Sentinel, request weapon slowdown. Uh, Sentinel, pilot, I've got eight missiles and two bombs on two predators in the target vicinity. Target five leaving building, entering pickup. Pickup now has priority. Pilot copies. Sensor copies. Pilot, sentinel, expect to be cleared hot for white pickup. Pilot, let's uh, spin up a weapon on tail 107. Copy. Pre-launch checklist. PRF code. Entered. AEA power. On. AEA bit. In progress. Passed. Weapon power. On. Weapon bit. Passed. Code weapons. Coded. Weapon status. Weapons ready. Pre-launch checklist complete. Pilot, Sentinel, you are clear to engage white pickup truck at your discretion. Pilot, clear to engage white pickup truck. So it's on the move. Launch checklist, MTS auto truck. Established. Laser. Laser selected. Go ahead and arm your laser. Laser's armed. Master arm is hot. Go ahead and fire the laser. Lazing. We're within range. Three, two, one, rifle. Three, two, one. Impact. Excellent job. Okay, so I, I, I thought you might might have found this interesting if you haven't seen it before. The 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 interesting question that arises here in terms of the um, what this does to these soldiers uh, who are involved in these control stations, whether they're located near Las Vegas, like this one is, or in Arizona or elsewhere around the world. So the, the story is that, you see, you, you saw this truck explode um, in a bunch of flame, a uh, beautifully guided missile uh, hit it and it exploded. But no one says anything about the fact that there were two human beings inside. Okay? And they were, of course, incinerated um, in that blast. Um, so the, the story is that, that uh, uh, people like these uh, operating these remote guided um, vehicles like this um, can uh, uh, cause these kinds of explosions and then go home and play with their children. Um, and uh, I think that it shows that to some extent the use of these uh, uh, military weapons, these, these uh, uh, what shall I say, these uh, uh, flying explosives that we have around are uh, in some sense dehumanize us. 
we have to somehow learn how to apply lethal force and yet at the same time not destroy our own humanity in the process. And I think that's one of the serious issues, okay? Now, the person who helped me set this up, can I go back to the regular slides? I'd like to go back to this. Okay, so, um, all right, so, um, so, so let's look at, um, um, at, at some of these issues that I've raised before. So, uh, what has happened in the past now, at least in some areas, what, there have been a couple of disastrous um, errors that have occurred as a result of the fact that the, uh, we have to act with extremely high speed, which computers can do much better than humans. We are relatively slow uh, compared to the ability of computers to process information. And as a result of that, there are situations in which um, the soldiers have uh, trusted information on the, from the computers uh, in their automatic systems much more than they trusted their own judgment. And therefore, um, dangerous events have occurred where friendly vehicles have been destroyed um, as well as uh, enemy vehicles. So um, the fact that we're so slow compared to the pace of modern warfare is in fact one of the issues that's related to, to this whole ethical question. Okay. Now, um, much of this arises, uh, the discussion about this arises among philosophers uh, from a classical uh, thought experiment which is known as the trolley problem. And I think you'll see right away how it's related um, to, to the general issues of robot warfare. So the trolley problem, which I think dates back only maybe a hundred years or so, uh, originated by some philosopher, um, it, it is usually posed as follows. Um, there's a, a trolley on a track and the trolley driver loses control. The brakes have failed and he's charging forward at increasing speed. There are five people on the track and uh, um, if, he doesn't, if he doesn't stop, which he cannot do, or derail onto his side track, then the five people will be killed. Now you are standing there by the side of the track and you have access to a lever that opens a uh, side rail so that the trolley can go off to the side where only one person is working and that one person will be killed rather than five. So now the question is, do you throw the switch? And what are the moral implications of this? So a lot of this depends now on what kind of an, what your approach is to, uh, to ethical judgment. Uh, should you should you divert the trolley to the track where only one person is killed? Well, it depends on your moral sense. If you believe in the kind of imperative which says that all killing is sinful and there is no such a thing as a gradation of sins, that one sin is as bad as another, then it doesn't matter, right, whether you kill one person or five. Uh, on the other hand, uh, most people, I think, would say that it would be the, not only the proper but the imperative thing to do to divert the trolley onto the track where only one person is killed. Now, there are many variations of this experiment, and they, uh, how you interpret the answers depends on which school of philosophy um, you subscribe to. And there are many approaches to, to ethical issues. Um, give you another one. Uh, you're standing on a bridge, and you see this out-of-control trolley coming underneath you. And you realize, gee, if only I could throw something really heavy in front of the trolley, maybe I could stop it and keep it from killing those five people. And as luck would have it, standing next to you is a very fat man. So what you do is you push the fat man onto the, um, rail, onto the track, and by golly, it stops the train. And the five people are saved. On the other hand, um, most people would now say there's a big difference between this and throwing the side switch because in this case, um, the, the killing of the fat man is in fact murder. Okay. But as I say, this a lot depends on what your own personal philosophy is and what kind of an approach uh, to ethics uh, you follow. So, um, so the fat man scenario um, clarifies this issue and makes it more difficult for you to decide whether you, do, you will or will not uh, push this guy out. All right, let me switch from that to a different scenario. 
So visualize a situation in which a commanding officer sends a uh, robot out to a safe house. This is a place where um, uh, dangerous insurgents um, are known to be hiding, and your instructions to the robot are, go to the house and destroy it. Robot goes to the house, but because the robot has much better sensors than we as humans have our own personal senses, he can tell from a combination of temperature, vision, smell, etc., that in fact, in addition to the dangerous um, insurgents, there are children in the house. And the program that the robot is, is equipped with also include a uh, moral sensor uh, or an ethical governor, as Ron Arkin calls it, uh, which uh, acts as a, as a uh, uh, governor um, over the actions that the robot would perform. And because killing innocent civilians is a violation of the laws of war, um, the robot may not want to do that, but on the other hand, he has instructions from the commanding officer to destroy the house. So now he's caught in a dilemma. Um, I'm referring to the robot as a he rather than a she, but I think you understand that it's basically a, a sexless robot, so it has to do whatever it's, it's going to do. So, um, all right, so, so now the question is, um, the robot is faced with a contradiction in its instructions. It has commanding officer instructions, and it has built-in ethical governor uh, instructions. And you all know what happens if you give contradictory instructions to a computer. It has a tendency to freeze and lock up, and nothing happens. So, um, so, so that's the kind of a dilemma um, that, is, that our military robots can face. And again, what we do has a lot to do with what kind of a uh, view of ethics uh, we have and how we behave in these situations. All right. All right, let me pose a different scenario. Um, this is one that um, my collaborator, Patrick Lynn, um, uh, developed in connection with the studies of, of Google um, autonomous cars. So the story is that a, one of the Google cars is traveling on the freeway on the lane, and in front of it, a major object falls off a truck. So the car has to swerve either to the left or to the right uh, to avoid hitting the object, not knowing whether it's an explosive or not. Both lanes are full on the left and on the right. So assume that the car on the left is a, uh, um, is a Volvo um, SUV, a, uh, a sports utility vehicle, which is quite heavy. And on the other side is a mini car of some kind. So which one should he hit when he swerves? Right? So if he hits the heavier car, because it has, it's much better protected and has much better sidewalls and so on, the probability of injuring the occupants is much lower than if he swerves to the right and hits the mini car, where he probably will kill the occupant. Right? So, in some sense, it seems like an obvious decision. But on the other hand, what does it do to the sales of heavier cars if they now would know that they're most likely to be hit by autonomous cars than if they were driving a light vehicle? It's a, it's a question we don't usually think of. Uh, but, um, but in some sense, we're penalizing uh, the driver of the heavier SUV. Okay? It's, now, there's a similar situation. Um, a variation of this problem has to do with the fact that there are motorcycles on both sides, and the motorcyclist on the left is wearing a helmet, and the motorcycle on the right is not. So again, if you want to uh, um, avoid the probability of killing the motorcycle driver, you swerve to the left and hit the motorcyclist with a helmet. But this is punishing a man who is obeying safety instructions, and in California, um, helmets are mandatory when you're driving motorcycles. Okay. So here we're, we're penalizing and possibly killing the guy who's obeying the law and doing it this way. So, so I, I, I raise these two scenarios because it shows that these ethical issues are not obvious and one has to uh, very carefully think the consequences of, of what, what may happen to particular actions. Now, in, uh, um, I'd better wind this up fairly quickly. Um, now, the, the question then is, how do we control robots? Um, Ronald Arkin, who was mentioned earlier, uh, has uh, developed a set of software uh, for military robots, which include um, 
an, a, quote, ethical governor, unquote, which means that all instructions to the robot are measured with respect to a set of ethical criteria and may or may not carry out the instructions depending on what the, what the criteria are. Um, and we've tried to control these things to some extent by international agreements dating all the way back to 1868. Um, there was a declaration signed by most of the European nations at that time. Uh, this was a, called the St. Petersburg Declaration, which said that using heavy explosives is designed to kill people, whereas the use of light explosives is most likely to injure them rather than killing them and therefore is unethical. And therefore, all countries that signed the declaration agreed that they would not use any munitions that weighed less than 400 grams. Uh, you, you can see how these questions of, of what we do and what the consequence of our actions are um, have to do with, uh, with how we design our weapons. Asimov's laws are, are very well known. Uh, a robot may not injure a human being. Um, a robot must obey the orders given to it by human beings. And a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. What's interesting is that um, these laws basically imply that the robot is, um, has some sense of its, of its own self. And, um, therefore can respond uh, to issues of this kind. This is not written as instructions to the humans, it's instructions written for the robot. So the robot it's, itself um, must do or not do certain things. Okay? There's a variation of, of these laws um, written by a, uh, uh, a writer, philosopher, um, commentator, uh, uh, named David Swanson, who wrote uh, what he calls the Pentagon Laws of Robotics. And, and notice what these are. A Pentagon robot must kill and injure human beings as ordered. A Pentagon robot must obey all orders, except when such orders result from human weakness and conflict and conflict with the mission to kill and injure. And finally, a Pentagon robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. So these are a set, this is a set of laws or instructions that are designed to maximize the killing potential uh, of the robot rather than um, Asimov's laws. Uh, by the way, uh, those of you who know Asimov's laws and who read his uh, short stories and novels realize that many of the stories um, have to do with what happens if those laws are violated in one way or another. Okay. Now, so what ethical principles are involved? Well, um, the, one of the most common ones is known as ethical relativism. And this basically says that there is no objectivity in ethical matters, that what's right and wrong is not a matter of fact, but is the result of individual or cultural preferences. Um, we'll ignore this for the moment. I mean, it's very clear that there are cultural preferences in such things as uh, um, man-woman relationships and design of houses and education and so on, but probably in matters of killing others, they're much more international acceptance than, than others. Um, what some people call contemporary ethics is uh, to say that what's right is what you can get away with. Uh, fairly common among young people in the United States, uh, and uh, it's a very dangerous uh, view of, of ethics, I think. Um, Top-down programming um, or deontological ethics has to do with uh, designing rules in such a way that the robot would follow them without exception. Uh, these are these are rules that in some sense could come from on high. These are divinely inspired rules, and therefore you must obey them. But on the other hand, um, they're not necessarily robust enough for all situations. And uh, so um, all of these principles um, clearly have problems. You can also use um, a set of ethical rules that are based on evolution and human development. So human children developed in a moral sense, both from a combination of instructions from parents um, and also from, from experience and the interpretation of experience, much more so than explicit rules from the top. So we can design neural networks, for example, or other methods that can, to enable a system to learn from experience and to reward desired behaviors. Um, those uh, AI methods that use a teacher are an example of, uh, of uh, this kind of an approach um, uh, to developing an ethical sense. A combination of top-down and bottom-up rules is sometimes known as virtue ethics. 
So you know, that means that, that the person or robot must learn from experience and also to know that certain rules are morally mandated. Okay. So um, I just have a couple more slides and I want to finish this up. The, uh, I think it's clear that as the abilities of robots increase, there will be new moral issues that we haven't thought of before. Um, and at least these, uh, if we're prepared for the fact that these issues will arise, it'll, put us, it, it'll at least put us back to thinking what is known from the experience of the race and where we go from here. Uh, robots have advantages over humans in the sense that they're resistant to the stress of war. Um, but now, would a robot be able to sense friend from foe, an enemy or a compatriot more easily than humans? Well, it's not clear, right? If, you take, if enemy soldiers put on the uniforms of your own comrades, maybe the robot will not be able to tell them apart. Uh, so uh, there's an issue in, uh, in the international laws of war, which is uh, sometimes known as the proportionality of force. Um, that is, if, um, if the enemy um, attacks uh, two of your soldiers and kills them, are you justified then in sending um, 20,000 soldiers to destroy 20,000 of the enemy. That's not a very proportional response. And this is one of the reasons why Israel has been criticized so heavily for its attacks in some places in Palestine, where they used overwhelming force in response um, to a small number of killings from the other side. I'm not defending one or the other. I'm just saying that the, the proportionality is one of the issues that, that arises in trying to interpret um, what the ethics are of particular military situations. So, so the question that many people ask, including myself, is whether using robots in war, um, that is enabling a national leader, say a president of the United States, to begin a war by using entirely robots. If that's the case, uh, would that lower um, the barriers we normally have against starting a war? Among other things, if you only send robots out, this means that you would not be subject to criticism from your citizens. Um, since no humans would be involved, um, the chances are that the citizens wouldn't worry about it too much. They would just let the, let the robots go and do, do whatever they have to do. But if that's the case, does that mean that the use of robots could lead to more wars rather than fewer? Okay. And, and then, if the robots do not perform as programmed, who will be responsible for their actions? The designer, the manufacturer, uh, the robot itself, um, the owner of the robot, society? I think we have not yet answered these questions yet. These are among the ones that I think we need to, as a society, we need to address in the next few years. And we need to do this soon because uh, uh, robotic warfare is developing very rapidly, as Ludovic pointed out uh, at the beginning. All right, well, I think I'm going to skip this for the moment and just make a couple of comments. So I think it's clear that robot warfare is here, whether we like it or not, and that it has unexpected consequences. Many countries have military robotics programs, and therefore the probability of, of the use of robots in warfare is growing, I would say, by the day. Uh, more and more military robots are being equipped with lethal weapons. They're not just surveillance uh, vehicles, they're, they're designed to kill. When the robots receive the authority to fire without human control, what ethical safeguards will there be? Notice that I said when rather than if. Uh, even though in the United States, uh, the predators and reapers that you saw may not release their weapons without human control, uh, it's clear that all the services in the United States are interested in looking at purely autonomous vehicles that can fire on their own, okay? And, and it's not clear. So it's clear, however, that ethical issues like that are at the core of future decisions in military robotics. And I'm not at all sure that they're being addressed adequately at the moment. In fact, I would probably say specifically that they're not being addressed and that they pose major dilemmas uh, for us um, in the coming decades. Okay. Thank you very much.